Thank you for staying with us. Uh, former President Lucia Grand Bassinger has urged the African youth to embrace artificial intelligence to advance their careers and prepare for the future. Speaking at the fifth edition of the Presidential Youth Mentoring Retreat at the Youth Development Center, the former president emphasized the trans transformative potential of AI. Mr. Bassan John noted that technology will soon dominate many aspects of human life and advised young people to seize every opportunity for personal development. Nigeria's former president also described AI as a game changer, predicting that by 2040, AI-driven technologies such as driverless vehicles will be commonplace. Well, joining us for this conversation is a technology expert, Stephen Onia. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. As much as the world, uh, like Japan, and uh, we see China also leading in the use of AI for advancement, when you look at Africa in comparison, and, even in, and Nigeria in particular, are we prepared to embrace AI especially with the fact that there are skills gap required and then structures needed for the success of embracing AI. All right, so I'm happy you mentioned China and Japan. You see, the journey to a full AI embrace is a long one. It's a very long one because it's one thing to have the capacity to use an AI product is another thing to have the capacity to build AI products. And we thank God for the wisdom the former president have lent to the youth. The chief has made it clear to us that if we don't embrace AI, there is no future. You see, we are a technologically dependent country in Nigeria. Technically, everything we use today, technologically, are imported. Even the amazing innovative products that we have built, that we call tech innovation in Nigeria, we have built using imported tools, subscriptions, and services. So this is our chance for the very first time to be able to build, not just use, to be able to build the kind of AI that properly aligns with our cultural norms in this society. However, being able to use AI products that already exist on the street, because we all cannot be a builder, but the, com the country must have a strategy for building its own local capacity for AI development. But to be able to tap into career growth, entrepreneurship, opportunities, job market, being able to use and apply AI products should be sufficient. Interesting. Um, my question is on what you've been happy on. Build, build, build. And how it's important that we build to align with our cultural norms. Why is that important? Okay, you see, I'm going to give you the basis on which AI operates. AI is layered on data. You see, most of the AI products you see today like uh, the popular one, that's ChatGPT, uh, they were trained based on publicly available data. It could be data of you and I, but they are data that are publicly available. You cannot build AI system, I mean, efficient AI system without data. Now, if you put data in its proper context, the kind of data we generate here in Nigeria, maybe on social media, our operational and transactional data in our workplaces, they carry our cultural identity. They carry our currency in Naira form. They carry our lingua. They carry our norms. The way we communicate, our language structure. We need to build AI based on our own data, not just adopt AI that was built based on foreign data. Pardon me, let me chip this in. Experts across the world have started introducing the concept of racist AI because of the lack of proper integration of different culture and norms into existing AI products. So the, the, the idea of being able to localize our own AI development 
into our local data systems. Our own cultural norm is very, very important. Mm. And I would like you to expand more on uh, the development of the racist AI because uh, critics have voiced concern on the limitless application of uh, the AI. And also, they have urged um, legal and possibly legislative uh, form of restriction to the use. Don't you think that's something we need to look into in Nigeria, looking at what we see on the internet today? Okay, if it's, if it's about, I'm going to connect, answer your question from two in two folds. I know you want me to talk about the racist AI, and you want to talk about the regulatory framework we have in place as a country that can protect us in the adoption of AI. You see, when it comes to the regulatory journey and the structures we need to have in place, I must be sincere with you, they are getting it somewhat correctly, somewhat correctly, because we've been carrying stakeholders along. But nevertheless, the fear that we've not institutionalized artificial intelligence as a country is the problem. You see, you cannot build AI without sufficient research. So the questions we should ask ourselves now is, how many people, how many institutions, how many academia, people in the academia are currently researching on AI within our local concept. That's what I think we should be asking ourselves. We need to ask ourselves that the social dynamics of what we represent. Let me give you an example. You see, the very fact that you are a Nigerian carries a tag, it carries a social code. If you go to some places in the world, the very fact that you are introduced as a Nigerian already raised a flag on your name. You see, that is what data can do. That is what information can do. We need to invest institutionally and infuse AI into our curriculum from the primary educational system to the secondary, into the tertiary system. We need to invest in a massive in, in research so we can even understand how this AI will apply to us when we start building. Because the data we have in this part of the world is not the same data they have in the Western part of the world. The way we interact with AI or the kind of questions Nigerians are asking ChatGPT. It's not the same kind of questions they are asking in the Western that ranks or in, the, in, the, in Europe. People are asking different and interact with AI in different ways. We need education. We need to institutionalize this adoption. We shouldn't leave it to the tech professionals and say we are the one that can do it all. Do we have the hands who, who can do all of these things? Talking about experts that can teach AI, that can research on it, and also ensure that the knowledge is spread, and also ensure that the nervousness that a lot of persons or the apprehension that people are having with regards to AI and its future is something that is dealt with holistically. I, I can answer your question affirmatively. Yes, we have experts in this country that can engage in a, 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 a professional AI research. Yes, we do. But the question is, are they motivated enough? You see, I've asked people to rule down or run down the academic system we have in this country, in our tertiary institution. But unfortunately, I have interacted with a lot of these academic leaders, the profs and the doctors. I've interacted with a lot of them. I listen to men and women. And the idea is, are they motivated enough to start researching into this kind of realm? The question we should ask ourselves is, technology itself is an evolving machinery. We are always learning. We are always researching. The fact that we are talking about AI today does not mean the next five years when we're talking about something completely different. So it's our nature in technology and computing to research and build products. So we have the talent. We need motivation. What can make a professor can go and start researching into how to engage his students with AI or innovative AI in academics. It's motivation. There's more to this than just saying all of us will be using chat GPT or be using AI to generate resume or be using AI to chat for jobs. We need more than that. We need to institutionalize it. How do you mean when you talk about motivation and also institu institutionalize the matter of AI? Because uh, there are those who are watching and wondering, why does a professor need to be perhaps motivated if this is his field? So uh, perhaps break it down for us, for us to better understand. Okay, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you an instance. You see, I've, I've had the privilege of 
being in some computer laboratories in this country. And it's appalling. It's appalling to teach AI you need infrastructure. AI is not theoretical and it's not just text based. You need infrastructure, solid infrastructure. You need to go to some computer laboratories we have in Nigerian universities and you will be disappointed. I've had the privilege also of interviewing some computer science graduates and you'll be surprised. Some of them have never even opened a computer. How can you expect a leading academia in that kind of environment who does not even have the resource and infrastructure to engage in efficient research that can teach the student to be able to deliver AI? I don't think it's possible. Right. So talking about AI, we still have a lot of uh, you know skilled youth in the country and the motivation you mentioned is is they have the challenge of keeping them. Uh, most uh, you know people who are skilled in technology in the use of AI most times are looking into emigrating, leaving the country. So in terms of motivation, what should the government be doing to ensure that they're not poached by other countries or perhaps to motivate them to stay back in the country and work for us? You see, you see, we have this this uh, brain drain issue that you have introduced. It's a serious issue. And it's an issue that technology cannot solve. It's an issue that we need to fix our economy. You see, uh, there are professionals in these countries that are still in this country and did not leave. But the problem we have is the more we train talent, the more the exodus of these talents. This is not a problem we can fix in technology. We need to make the country conducive. As a matter of fact, it is not only human beings that are doing Japan in this country. Businesses are also leaving. People are shutting down their businesses and restructuring their businesses in the US, in the UK. People are leaving the country en mass. That can only be fixed when the economy is friendly. When people can know, I can run my business with secured, constant power. When people can know, I can have an appointment on the mainland, and I'm leaving to Victoria Island, and I'm sure I will get there in 30 minutes. I don't have to be stuck in traffic and have to miss my appointment. It's until the economy and the system itself that interfaces and forms the economic system can be fixed. This is your brain drain. We can't fix it in technology. So that is the point for the leadership to fix. They have to fix it. All right. Uh, despite the optimism about AI, the use of AI and its advancement, there's also the matter of uh, data privacy and as well as the impact of this on the psychology of children. Recently, there were reports about a child who committed suicide because um, he was engaging with a chatbot so to speak, and so he killed himself at the end of the day. So how do we address all of these concerns as we look forward as a country to embracing AI? Okay, uh, you see, the same manner within which professionals like yourself bring these issues to the air on air and discuss it, those are what we propose, because sensitization is key. Just the same way we've expressed it, you have just given a negative impact of AI, where someone was starting the chatbot and they end up taking their own lives. This, these are realities of AI implementation. That's where we need a foundational sensitization. You see, AI is one specialty tool that if we get it right and we can properly integrate it into our academic system, where people come out from primary education, they know AI. They come out from secondary education. They know AI. They know the pros and the cons. We cannot achieve this without proper sensitization. We need the entire country to know that AI is a game changer. It's going to introduce new kind of jobs. As a matter of fact, as I speak to you today, there's a new kind of job called prompt engineering. It's a new kind of job that's coming up. People can become professional prompt engineers as of today. This is a new kind of job that was not existing before in technology. So the good and bad side of artificial intelligence need to be discussed foundationally in our educational system. And experts across the world, across this AI explainability, AI accountability, and AI transparency. Once you can put this telescope 
into this uh, synthesization network of Nigerians. Well, you know, AI transparency, AI accountability, and AI explainability, we can manage the downsides. But I'm one of the advocates. Don't let us be scared of adoption because of the downside. Let's adopt it and research into it and see how we can make it right for our society. Okay, let's not leave the viewers hanging. Uh, we need to understand the three issues you just pointed out, AI transparency and the others. Talk to us about it and okay. also address the matter of data privacy that is also a concern. All right. So you see, in ethical AI practice, in ethical AI practice, there are certain way we measure the performance and efficiency of an AI. Number one, we believe an artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence system, ethically should be transparent. Experts like you that, that, that built it should be able to explain how you built it. We should be able to look at your AI from outward they are able to say we are not manipulating data. That's why we talk about AI transparency, AI accountability, and AI explainability. It is believed in the community of experts across the world. <laughs> Pardon me. In the community of experts across the world, that AI needs to be explainable. It needs to be transparent and it needs to be accountable. And these should be parameters that can be measured by fellow experts when they're interacting with your AI system. See, the concept of data privacy does not only have to do with you or the person accessing your data. You see, the first step in being able to guarantee data privacy is you yourself determining the privacy setting of what you are putting out there. Because AI has every right to crawl, analyze, and extract public data. Because if you post something on Facebook, or you post something on Google My Business, or you post something online, and you set your privacy setting to public, it was you that determined that your content is public, that is no longer private. Data privacy rights do not apply to you. But when you set your content as private, and they are exploiting it, that is where you can claim your data privacy right. As it is today, AI systems across the world are crawling public data. They are crawling through public data, analyzing public data, but it was you that determined it. From what we've seen so far, we've not really seen major data privacy abuses. When I mean major, I'm not saying they're not minor ones. Major data privacy abuses in artificial intelligence, because most of the products you've seen so far were built on public data. Mm. And while this is a prospect for the Nigerian economy, I mean, it's a way of you know diversifying the economy. Some persons still see the AI as a threat, especially to their jobs. Uh, when we begin to look into automation of jobs in the health sector, manufacturing and all that, how are we likely to address the unemployment gap that this, will, this is going to cause? Okay, uh, please permit me to answer this question logically. You see, first and foremost, there will be job losses. AI will take jobs. We cannot stop that. Because the more innovation speeds up, the more new jobs are introduced. Let me give you an example. There, there are some job titles we have today that did not exist in the past. For example, platforms like Zoom that were built in the, in the that, that became popular in the age of, during the lockdown, became platforms that people now call themselves and a live streamer. People go around setting up Zoom and making Zoom work just for themselves, live streamers. There are people that go around today, there are job posts online looking for prompt engineers. What we should focus on are the kind of jobs that will be introduced that will replace the types that were lost. And that's why we are saying upskilling and cross skilling are very key. No matter the skill set you have today, you need to tell yourself. I need to learn something new, something that is valuable for tomorrow, something I can use cross-sector, that I can use technology-wise. What are the new tools that have been introduced in the technology space that I can learn and be able to say I have a skill? And the beauty of all this is you can interact with ChatGPT to guide you. You no longer need a consultant to ask these questions. 
You can go to chat GPT and have a chat and say, I want to be able to equip myself for the future. What are the skill sets I need to equip myself with? What should I learn? What should I, what should I equip myself? What are the skill sets that will be relevant in the next five years? You can ask chat GPT these questions and you will get the valid answer. Now, let's look at um, the matter of uh, digital infrastructure that is capable of pushing the advancement of AI use in the country. What, what, are they, what do we need to do as a government and um, perhaps as states to addressing this matter? But before you answer that question, let's quickly go on a break. When we return, we'll, ask, we'll continue with this conversation. Thank you for staying with us. Before we went on the break, we were talking about the statement from former President Olusha Gwamba-Sanjo, where he urged African youth to embrace the use of artificial intelligence to advance their careers and prepare for the future. And we've been speaking with Stephen Onia, a technology expert. Stephen, the question I asked before we went on the break, talking about digital infrastructure, it is a major pain point that has to be addressed. If we are looking at advancing the use of AI or embracing the use of AI as a country and as states at the subnational level. And I'm asking, um, what then do we need as it is? You've talked about the, the positives of uh, the use of AI, but we are obviously in deficit of the structure required. What should we do then? Okay, uh, you've made a very, very important argument that we are in deficit. And that's the very truth. You see, to power any AI system, you need, there are three key infrastructures you need to have in place. First, your internet backbone, that's like the 5G networks. Yes, we need it. I remember the last administration, that was the former president, Muhammad Buhari, with all the achievements we have with the 5G infrastructure, there was so much boasting of what this 5G will do for us. It was as if in less than one year, we start doing remote surgery in Nigeria. And some of us made it clear then that this old noise, that it does not really happen that easily. Now, you've mentioned this infrastructural gap again. We are a country with capacity. And I want to assure you, you see, AI systems infrastructural requirement have gone beyond localization. We now have a sufficient global cloud-based infrastructure system that we can use to power AI. However, we need our own local capacity. Please let me be emphatically clear. There is one particular infrastructure that we cannot do without. That is the internet backbone. And that's why some of us, we are very, very worried. We are worried to the extent that the internet state in this country is appalling and nobody is auditing it, nobody is reporting about it. Now, that is to talk more about the database systems, the server system, the Hadoop infrastructure we might need to process big data infrastructures. These things don't come cheap. They are very expensive. And, as, and if you look at the way we are as a nation now, in terms of infrastructure, we can't catch up with what is going on with the Western world. So what I would recommend is 
let's jump on the cloud. Let's talk about data sovereignty. I have always advocated. I don't believe in the government and its agencies putting our national data on foreign cloud systems. But as a country, we can have our own elastic cloud infrastructure. The journey to a reliable infrastructural system in this Oh, all right. Uh, Stephen O'Neill, are you still there? I'm here. I'm here. I'm still okay. here. Okay, so you can just finalize your thoughts because at some point we didn't hear you. Oh, sorry about, sorry about that. What, what, I, what I was saying was we have, truly we have a huge infrastructural gap as a nation. But I don't think uh, the entire scope of having a reliable infrastructure to in the house. That's why we have cloud systems. Right. We have cloud networks that can help us power our AI journey. All right. We'll have to leave the conversation there now because so much has been said. But we must thank you, Stephen O'Neill, technology expert, for your time on the program. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Great. And the federal government, along with state and local government councils, have taken a significant step towards strengthening grassroots development in Nigeria. Join us after the break for more insight.